Hi, my name is Alex Sinenko, and I would like to present MLIR, which stands for Multi-Level Compiled Infrastructure. We developed MLIR to address the growing needs of domain-specific compilation and the diversity of target hardware. MLIR is an open source project, and as such, is a result of work of numerous people beyond those who contributed to the original paper and this presentation. In this talk, I will first explain why we decided to build a new compiler infrastructure, then present MLIR's design philosophy and how we implement it in practice before highlighting several uses of MLIR to demonstrate how its design choices are influencing compiler construction. Let's get straight to it, and let's start with the question. Why did we decide to build a new compiler infrastructure when LLVM exists? Indeed, LLVM's intermediate representation is a de facto industry standard for compiler abstractions. However, it is a mid-level representation similar in the abstraction level to C with vector types and single static assignment. In practice, a compilation pipeline uses multiple representations. On the lower level, LLVM IR gets converted to the instruction select representation, then to several machine level IRs. On the higher level, for the C language, for example, the input program is first converted into an AST, which gets lowered to LLVM IR through a rather convoluted process due to the huge abstraction gap between the two representations. This abstraction gap is large enough so that the Clang compiler actually has an alternative intermediate representation, Clang CFG, that is used in parallel to AST for advanced diagnostics and static analysis. Several other tools, such as Poly, raise from LLVM IR to a higher level of abstraction to be able to reason about even simple programming constructs such as loops before generating LLVM IR back. Newer language implementations tend to define custom intermediate representations that reside between AST and LLVM IR. For example, Swift has SIL, Rust has MIR, and even Fortran nowadays has FIR. These are used to perform transformations aware of the language semantics, such as borrow checking in Rust. It is not even only source languages that do this. In fact, modern ML frameworks subsume a domain-specific compiler, sometimes without realizing it or without using well-established compiler construction patterns. This big picture prompts a question. How much of the code in it is unique? How many times do we have to implement type system support, common optimizations like dead code elimination and inlining, common features like location tracking and path management? Or, put differently, what are the most fundamental concepts that are necessary to build any compiler? To answer briefly the original question that we had, why build ENS compiler infrastructure, we can answer this so that we don't need to build the next 700 infrastructures. Instead, we can contribute to a common project and focus on the most interesting research parts. We decided to build a new infrastructure that supports all of the use cases above based on a set of core principles. We have three design principles, the first of which is concept parsimony, which can be seen as applying Occam's razor to compiler land. The infrastructure has few but powerful built-in concepts that are sufficient to express a wide variety of abstractions. The small number of built-in concepts avoids incidental complexity where one can no longer navigate the representation effectively. The second principle is traceability. With multiple abstractions now used in a compilation stack, it is crucial to keep track of where transformation happens and how it affects the final code. Most programmers at least once have blamed the compiler error for results. Most of the time, it wasn't actually a compiler error, but more of a lack of communication about what happens inside the compiler. We believe compilers should not be scary black boxes that nobody understands and better explain what they do and how. The final principle is progressivity. Paraphrasing Knut in compilers Premature lowering is a predecessor of all evil. It is often easier to preserve high-level information available at the entry program than extract it from the lower-level representation. Lowering should be a conscious choice of discarding the information already available at the high level. Also, to help with traceability, intermediate transformation state can be made inspectable and modifiable, leading to a progressive lowering. These principles lead to the following requirements. Everything in the IR should be extensible. We want the IR to support static single assignment forms, arbitrary graphs, and regions, each of which are known to be a substrate for advanced optimizations. We need a really good tracking of source locations. We could use declarative definitions, 
because they're helpful to reason about compiler's behavior. And finally, we would like to support sufficiently high level abstractions without forcing the compiler to go too far too soon. Let's look at the current design of MLIR and see how these design principles are implemented in practice. In these and the following slides, the code below illustrates the generic representation of MLIR with relevant concepts highlighted. Following the concept or simony principle, the IR structure consists of only three core concepts. First is the operation, or OP for short. An operation is a unit of execution semantics. Operations specify what is computed and how, and have a programmable mechanism for verifying invariance. Operations can be arbitrarily complex, so we explicitly avoid naming them as instructions. Regions are containers that can be attached to an operation and contain other operations. They can be static single assignment dominance based control flow graphs or just arbitrary graphs without SSA dominance. Regions are lexically scoped and may be isolated from above, meaning that they cannot use the objects defined outside these regions. Blocks are a list of operations with linear control flow contained in region. The last operation in the block can transfer control flow to other blocks or to the parent region. IR structures recursive. Block contain operations which have attached regions, which can contain further blocks, and so on. MLIR operates on three kinds of objects. The most important one is a value, which represents data at runtime. Values are used and defined by operations and blocks and obey single static assignment rule. All values are typed. Types contain information about the value known at compile time. Operations specify types of the values they define and use. Attributes contain information known about an operation at compile time, similarly to types for values. They may be optional, like LLVM's metadata, or required by operation semantics. And this is pretty much everything you need to know about MLR concepts. That being said, almost everything in MLR is extensible. There is no fixed set of operations. For example, we have operations that present machine integer arithmetics, LLVM IR intrinsics as first class operations, TensorFlow operations, affine loops, and even semiconductor circuits. There is no fixed set of types either. MLR allows one to represent integers, machine vectors, multidimensional buffers or tensors, all of LLVM IR types, all of Fortran types, and so on. Similarly, there is no fixed set of attributes. It is possible to add attributes for integer or string values, locations, which is necessary for source location tracking we wanted, affine maps, opaque AST node pointers, and so on. All these extensibility hooks can be combined in what we call a dialect, which can be seen as a modular library that contains relevant IR objects designed to work together. Multiple dialects can coexist in MLIR, enabling progressive transformation and lowering of higher level abstractions as required by our design philosophy. Dialects roughly correspond to an abstraction level or a programming model. For example, we have dialects for LLVMIR, TensorFlow graphs, polyhedral forms, and so on. Beside attributes, operations, and types, dialects are programmable extension points that can implement custom syntax, binary decoding, optimization hooks, and other things. Within a dialect, each operation can further define invariance on, for example, the number of operands and results, their types, as well as what are its mandatory attributes. Operations can be programmed to have custom syntax, include canonicalization patterns and folding rules, and many other things. Let us now look at several users of MLIR that introduced new dialects. The TensorFlow infrastructure was one of our early motivations to build MLIR. It contains multiple internal representations, which are custom or based on, for example, protocol buffers. It also performs numerous compiler-style conversions, such as common sub-expression elimination, as well as representation conversion between, say, TensorFlow and TensorFlow Lite. TensorFlow graphs can be represented as an MLIR dialect. Don't worry, there is no need to read all of this code. We can look at specific details instead. In this graph, tensors are represented as SSA values. Therefore, common transformations such as common subscription elimination and dead code elimination apply seamlessly as to other graphs. The TensorFlow graph itself is an operation with an attached region that is not a traditional CFG because MLR allows it and it's just easier to express TensorFlow graphs that way. 
Instead, partial execution ordering in this graph is possible through token typed values that are produced and used similar to any other values. These values ensure happens before semantics. Finally, resources have memory-like semantics and can be read or assigned to using dedicated operations. They are thus amenable to memory style allocation packing optimizations similar to register allocation. Another example is the polyhedral representation, a base for multiple research advances that has gotten new attention in recent years, thanks to it delivering state-of-the-art results for machine learning and image processing workloads. MLR allows one to combine the benefits of the SSA form with a polyhedral representation by using a polyhedral or affine dialect. In this dialect, a polyhedral optimizer can leverage the multidimensional structure of standard types available in MLR, such as the memref type, to avoid complex polynomial undressing. Loop nests amenable to polyhedral transformations are first-class operations with loop bodies represented as region and polyhedral invariants encoded in the operation itself. Memory access operations are replicated in the affine dialect to add support for affine access patterns expressed as affine map attributes. Finally, any operation without side effects can be used to express the computational payload, ranging from instruction-like additions of floats to opaque tensor level operations such as sparse convolutions. Loop structure can be transformed independently of the body. It can be transformed to other loops or a CFG, or parallelized, or vectorized. This perfectly illustrates the idea of progressive lowering that was one of the requirements for design of an LAR. Having discussed several examples, we can now look at how the openness and flexibility of MLR affects compiler construction. By analyzing and implementing multiple abstractions, many more than we have time to examine the presentation, we observed that many transformations don't need to care about specific operations or instructions. They only need to know about properties or traits of an operation, such as it not having side effects or being associated. When static properties are not enough, operations can follow OOP-style polymorphism by having and implementing a common interface. In this case, generic transformations can rely on interfaces to adapt their behavior to the operation. This shifts the knowledge of the transformation from the path that previously listed all instruction it applies to, to the individual operations. At the same time, this approach does not prevent one from having domain-specific passes that understand specific operations if necessary and perform domain-specific transformation given the knowledge of operations. Let us look now how a generic loop invariant code motion pass can be implemented in MLIR. This transformation can be applied to any operation within a region without needing to know if it's a for loop, a while loop, a Fortran loop, if it fits into a polyhedral model or not. It is sufficient that the operation implements a loop-like interface and provides three functions. The first function checks if a value is defined outside the loop. This cannot be done generically because not everything has CFG dominance and all regions might be isolated. Implementations can be reduced, however, by different operations. Second function obtains the body of the loop in a generic fashion. And the last function hoists a given operation out of the loop body. Again, this cannot be defined generically because loop bodies might be isolated from above, at which point values used inside the loop must be forwarded into it using operands or attributes or other mechanisms. A simple feasibility analysis can be based on the body operations having either a no side effect trait or a recursive side effect trait for nest to support nested loops. With this, we can use the following structure of the pass. For all loop-like operations, so operations implementing the given interface, get the body of this operation, which can be done with an interface method. In this body, we can ignore all operations with side effects by checking they don't have a corresponding trait. Uh, we can ignore operations containing side effect in traits by looking at operations that have recursive side effect traits and checking if the operations they contain recursively have no side effects. For all the other operations, if their operands are defined outside of the loop, which we can again check with an interface method, we can hoist those operations out of the body using this third and last function of the open interface. And on the next iteration of our pass, the hoisted values will be defined outside. 
the path will iterate until completion. As you can see, MLIR forces us to think about necessary and sufficient conditions for implementing a transformation, rather than how it applies to specific instructions or operations. Similarly, MLIR forces us to think about extensibility and interoperability. Most dialects are not hermetic. They must coexist with other dialects and need to interact with each other. Arguably, interoperability and reuse are just good programming practice that was missing from compiler abstractions for a long time. MLIR also makes it easy to map an external format to a dialect using a simple translation and then use common transformation mechanisms within the infrastructure to convert the format into anything else, including other formats. MLIR has already started changing compiler construction, but it may have even further reaching effects. For example, it makes it easy to add domain-specific constructs for any domain and implement relevant transformations before using most of the lowering flow that can now be truly shared by many domain-specific languages. There is no separation between first-class instructions and second-class intrinsics. We can model entire ISAs as dialects and build DSL to ISA flows without leaving the infrastructure. The circuit project goes even further by defining hardware directly using MLIR dialects, so you can write a program in MLIR and lower it to hardware designs. The open type system allows one to experiment with novel or unconventional type systems, such as quantized numbers or mixed precision floating point arithmetic. MLIR makes it easy to support new programming models and design abstractions based on transformations we need to perform, rather than the say, inverse. The focus on persistent intermediate representation lets MLIR expose fine-grained control of the compiler behavior to the expert user, also to external tools such as auto-tune and search. For example, a transformation can be controlled by attaching attributes to an operation, which can be added by an external heuristic mechanism that does not need to know anything about MLIR infrastructure. We are also interested in using machine learning to replace handwritten heuristics and be ready for the jungle of upcoming hardware. To summarize, MLIR is a new extensible compiler infrastructure based on the principles of parsimony, traceability, and progressivity. It has few but powerful built-in concepts. The IR itself is structured as nested regions of basic blocks containing arbitrarily complex operations which process typed SSA values and are annotated as attributes. It allows for expressing abstractions ranging from instruction sets, tensor flow graphs, and has an extensible set of operations, attributes, and types. MLIR forces us to rethink compiler transformations in terms of abstract properties of operations and types, rather than instruction lists and typesets. It also forces us to design abstractions that are better amenable to advanced transformations, rather than adapt transformations to the abstractions we already have. If you'd like to try MLIR or contribute, it is a completely open source and publicly available project can get the source code from mlir.dev slash source and connect us using the links you see on the slides. Thank you for your attention.